Today we have a very special guest, Grandmaster Ramesh. He is a world leading coach and a key force behind the talent coming out of India. Uh, to quote my friend, he is training an army of Indian GMs. And uh, he, he has also brought out the generational talent Prague. Um, Ramesh, it's a pleasure to have you today. Hello, Yang. Really <laughs> pleasure to be here. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd like to start with a question which uh, I hope you won't uh, keep the secrets away from us with your humility. But there are a lot of, a lot of coaches out there. So now if I go on to leechess.com or even chess.com and I click on the coaches section, I can keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And there are so many coaches offering coaching. What would you say separates you from the other coaches? I would say... Uh, uh, for me, coaching, I don't see it as a profession. It's more of my passion and in a way, it's kind of uh, my calling, I, I should say, uh, because I've been a player uh, from a very young age, starting from the age of 12 when I started playing. And then uh, I became a grandmaster at the tender age of 29. It took a uh, painful 17 years to become a grandmaster. and. Uh, it taught me a lot of important lessons on what we should be doing and what we should not be doing. And when I was looking around, uh, I felt uh, most of the players were in a similar boat. At least I managed to become a grandmaster eventually after a lot of struggle. But most players, uh, they could not become, let's say, international masters or grandmasters. And uh, i really sad to see that uh, most of them are not able to realize their dreams. And they all had similar doubts, questions like I had when I was a player and what is the right approach, how I should help myself in a better and efficient manner. And all these questions uh, are there for everyone, but unfortunately there are no right answers and uh, there are not enough uh, trainers, mentors available whom we can access easily and get our doubts cleared at the right time and also get the, the right direction to put our efforts on. So <clears throat> I started working with uh, some players uh, here and there and uh, my first uh, stint as a trainer happened in 98 uh, when the Indian Federation uh, uh, requested if I can go with the junior team, under 20 team for the Asian Junior Championship in Iran. And I was only 22 years old at the time and I was really happy to go with the team because they were all my friends and compatriots. And immediately after the Asian Championship where we won gold in both boys and girls, but not to my effort, not due to my effort, um, <clears throat> Arti Ramaswamy, who is my wife, uh, at the time she was a young upcoming player from India. Uh, her parents uh, suggested uh, if I could uh, be a practice partner because back then we did not have uh, even the term coaching in chess. So if we could just uh, practice together. Right, and I was right. really happy to do that. And the following year in 99, she won the World Under-18 Championship. And when, when you were her part, practice partner, I suppose you weren't romantically involved at the no, time. No, yeah. we were both uh, too young. And uh, back then, uh, I was just uh, trying to help her become a better chess player. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> she won the World Under-18 the following year, wow. 99. And uh, that made it kind of... Uh, clear to me that this is the path I should take. And immediately after that, we I started getting uh, many offers from uh, players. But back then, it was mostly mm -hmm. players over 2300 rating who were trying to become IM and GM and were struggling to do so. And uh, most of my students, they immediately started uh, showing very good results. In a few months' mm -hmm. time, within a, less than a year, they were all becoming IMs and so on. Uh, <clears throat> then I, it became very extremely clear to me that uh, I should focus less on my playing career <laughs> and uh, become more of a trainer because that's where I'm more effective, uh, where I could be of more use to myself and others. And in 2008, I quit my job and uh, also my playing career. What was uh, your job? I was working as a deputy manager in an oil company, it's a uh -huh. Fortune 500 company. It's a well-paid job, but uh, I could not go to the office in the daytime and still managed to work with the players. Uh, so I had to take a tough call. It was a very risky decision financially, but uh, by then I was already married and uh, thanks to my wife, uh, 
she said like even if you are not going to make uh, much money out of this i understand this is your passion and uh, i want you to pursue this so she's very supportive yes i'm very always... happy to hear your success story because i've just quit my job last month but i'm not sure i have the same level of success as yourself <laughs> yeah i think it requires uh, to be a good trainer you should not just uh, see it as a profession where you can uh, make a living may earn good money out of it that should uh, come as a reward as a consequence of the good work we do mm -hmm. not uh, just because there is a huge demand mm. uh, as you are aware uh, post covid especially mm. there is a huge uh, rise in the popularity of the game both online sure. and offline. So money wasn't your main motivation? Yeah, it was not my main It was more the passion. Yes, I really wanted to make a difference mm -hmm. in few mm -hmm. players' mm -hmm. lives in a meaningful way. Yeah. And uh, that satisfaction, uh, it has no value. Mm -hmm. So I let's uh, let, let me delve into your own personal chess career. So from 12 to 29, you had 17 years pushing for Grandmaster. And... Uh, you mentioned there weren't really coaches back then. So let's say we could transport coach Ramesh today back to 12 year old Ramesh. How, how would things have been different in terms of how you worked on chess? What would be the sort of biggest differences? It would be very, very different from what I did. So when I, was, uh, when I started playing chess, it was uh, mainly because Vishy Anand had become a grandmaster at the same year. And I got inspired and uh, came to chess. So thanks to him, uh, Many thousands of players in India have come to chess. And then uh, I started getting uh, success quite early, I would I should say, because back then chess was not a very popular game and uh, no one was uh, really practicing hard to get better at the game. There were also not in many resources. The computers have not yet uh, come in, no internet, and not many chess books were available, not many chess tournaments were happening. But there were uh, quite a few a number of chess players uh, present even back then but they were all playing just out of passion for the game uh, so that i think is the first important lesson uh, which is uh, you have to be really passionate about something if you want to do well in that area so that unadulterated passion for the love for the game i think is uh, essential because uh, there will be many difficult moments tough mm, moments mm. when we would lose hope is that coachable does because passion yes, yes. i think uh -huh. uh, this is one of the major roles for a trainer really so so, so you we can... have to cultivate the passion right so usually like uh, some children are very clear that they are passionate about the game but with some children they have apprehensions mm -hmm. their doubts come in the way of mm -hmm. committing themselves permitting them to commit themselves so wholeheartedly they feel like what if i jump into this full-fledged Mm -hmm. and i am not able to do it well mm -hmm. then i won't i have lost many years in this journey so this prevents them from uh, applying them dedicating themselves wholeheartedly so uh, trainer's job will be to one cultivate passion uh, help them uh, devise some meaningful aims which is reachable uh, with some hard work and then teach them the value of hard work what are the topics they have to learn from what are the source materials and how it should be learned and what's the right mindset they should have so that they don't get bogged down by many of the psychological factors like fear of losing, fear of losing rating points and, uh, and so on. So there are many psychological barriers that come in the way of in our journey to become a better chess player. Mm -hmm. So it, all these are uh, teachable and uh, from a student's perspective, learnable. Okay. So, so coming back to cultivating passion, because I feel like um, this is one of my challenges, which is I have a lot of passion, but when I work, I try to work 10 hours a day on chess every day. By maybe the, you know, the 10th, 20th day, my, my passion is still there, but my kind of motivation Efficient. is not as mm -hmm. strong, right? I'm not as efficient. And let's say in the dream world, you are my trainer. How would you help me cultivate that passion to keep going? Yeah, so uh, what is happening currently is like uh, because of this boom in chess interest uh, in the, among the general public, many of the parents, they are uh, introducing uh, chess to their children. But in many cases, the children are not as passionate as the parents are. And the parents also become mostly very ambitious and they want to see their children like Gukesh or Arjun Ergesi or Abdul Satorov and so on. And that requires a lot of sacrifice effort, which... I believe we'll be covering 
later on so <clears throat> now in your case like you are mentioning you have been you are very passionate about chess you have uh, taken uh, an year off uh, from your uh, work to pursue chess and you are spending like 10 hours a day but after a few days you lose motivation sure. so uh, motivation will be high yeah. when we do something yeah. well or when we show growth in that activity so for example let's say i don't know swimming and i want to learn swimming and i go to some swimming lessons and if i am seeing progress in myself that i am able to do things which i was not able to do let's say yesterday or two days before now mm. i am able to do those things mm. so it gives me hope and the motivation to pursue in that effort activity much more uh, with much more uh, vigorousness and uh, interest and hope so progress in that activity is one good way to ensure that uh, we don't lose motivation mm-hmm. or the passion mm-hmm. and the other thing is like uh, we are learning things and uh, so you are able to do it well and the feeling that you are growing stronger getting better these two will ensure that uh, the passion mm. can stay high and keep doing so if i am able to swim very well after a few days then my passion in swimming will get better but if i am not able to learn even the basics in swimming after a few days mm-hmm. then i will lose interest in swimming right so, so the way we learn the game is crucial mm. so if you are training properly and we feel that we are getting stronger we won't lose motivation mm-hmm. yeah i'm thinking now uh, what i sometimes do puzzles on lee chess and and they're rated and uh, when i can gradually see the rating go up I, I, I feel more, more motivated to keep going, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, staying on the topic of chess improvement, um, there are many uh, amateur players out there who don't have the time to train 10 hours a day. If they have, say, only one hour a day, what would you say is the best use of that time for best efficiency in terms of chess improvement? So there are uh, two different approaches. One. So first we need to identify the important topics where we need to get better. Now for an aspiring professional, someone wants to become a 2700 player, let's say, or a grandmaster, let's say. In that case, uh, we all have a starting point. We start either as a positional player, more positionally inclined, uh, or uh, aggressive, like attacking players. Mm -hmm. And the third category is universal, who are comfortable in either of the situations. But most of us are uh, heavily inclined to either uh, positional or attacking. Now, this will be our starting point. So usually what one of the common mistakes players do is just stick to the st- strength. So let's say if I'm a positional player, mm. then I may tend to exchange pieces, go to end game, avoid complications, may not take risks when required, and uh, generally feel uncomfortable in risky situations where I don't have control. Mm situations where I don't have control over what's mm-hmm. happening, I may not feel comfortable and my quality of analysis will drop down drastically. And uh, when this happens, when we have become more aware that this is the kind of player I am, we tend to form a smaller circle and uh, stay within it. So I ca- start seeing studying games uh, of uh, players like Smith Low, Carpo, Petrosian and so on. I see games only of positional players. I will avoid seeing games, let's say, like mm-hmm. Tal or Shiro. It's because, important to be universal. Yes. So, but initially, like, uh, you can stick to your strength. Yeah. You yeah. try to become yeah. uh, stronger in uh, whichever area you feel comfortable at. This can be done by studying good players in uh, those areas. There are good middle game books. You can go through them and uh, <coughs> analyzing positions in that aspect of the game. And once you feel reasonably confident, let's say you start as a positional player, you work a lot on your positional chess and then after one or two years you feel my positional chess is quite good at a reasonably healthy level. Then it's time to focus on the aspects which are very contrary to our nature. Let's say on complications, taking Mm -hmm. risk, Mm -hmm. sacrificing material, Mm -hmm. playing in positions with imbalanced material and so on. And uh, so we don't develop an aversion to those things. Uh, any area which we avoid over a period of time, we start hating those areas. And we think like, I'm not good at this, so I should avoid these things. And uh, the more we go in this direction, we'll eventually become weak in those areas. And uh, our opponents will 
go through our games and they can easily identify mm-hmm. where we are not mm-hmm. doing well and they will try to take mm-hmm. us there more often so <clears throat> this is for the professional player so eventually you have to work on all the areas so for this you should know okay so i want i am a professional player i also want to learn attacking chess mm-hmm. now what are the different topics mm-hmm. i should learn within attacking style and what are the different topics i have to learn in positional style so i can become universally good so i would say the major areas a chess player a professional aspiring professional should focus on and get better at i would say first is the opening phase uh, although it's not very important till you are like 23 2400 of uh, fide rating you don't have to focus too much on openings that's my personal view and the other is calculation extremely important because this will occur in opening middle game and end game all phases of the game so you have to have very good calculation skills and third i would say good attacking skills because if you are a positional player and you are avoiding complications when you get good opportunity to attack we tend to exchange queens go to an end game mm. so we should have good attacking skills and uh, fourth i would say good positional skills and fifth converting advantage into wins because many times we may play a good opening get a slightly better position but later we spoil it so converting advantage into your win the process of that technique has to be good and the converse which is defending in difficult situations mm-hmm. we are not always going to get a pleasant uh, or advantageous Resilience. position yeah. yeah so we have to learn to fight back in difficult circumstances and finally end games mm-hmm. in end games i would say theoretical mm-hmm. and practical end games so these are the broad areas where we need to improve in the long run mm-hmm. so in the short run we have to so if you have one hour per day now you can choose any area whichever you like or whichever you have been avoiding for very long and then work on that area maybe like let's say half an hour every day for the next 3 months mm-hmm. so you can so for the next 3 months this particular area will be my focus and when i put half an hour a day for 3 uh, months i should make a reasonably healthy progress in that area and for the next 3 months i can choose a different topic and so on now this 3 months is just a indication it's not a uh, mm-hmm. fixed uh, criteria so you can choose maybe on a weekly basis you can change so this week i will focus on positional chess next week i'm going to focus on my calculation it can be done in any manner the player mm-hmm. wishes to Th- this is for the amateur players or this is for the yes even for uh, amateurs like uh, if they are mm-hmm. making progress in their chess strength it will keep them motivated and uh, help them Uh, continue in this path for a longer period else what will happen if you are not improving our chest strength and if you don't feel like we are getting any better then uh, our uh, training routine will become even more uh, half hazard maybe instead of working every day one hour i will start working whenever i feel like mm-hmm. or maybe it's like two days in a week i see chess and yeah. so on So uh those seven areas that you gave some of them are quite self explanatory how you improve for example calculation you can dive into puzzles uh i want to ask specifically on converting advantages and on defending positions yeah. how do you how do you work on those areas so in any area we want to progress we should not just uh, do the training in only one manner like you said to improve calculation we solve puzzles so just solving puzzles will not improve our calculation so uh, calculation means basically uh, we have to try to understand what what we do while calculating so while calculating we try to see ahead in the future right so if i do this and my opponent plays this i replay this my opponent mm-hmm. plays this mm-hmm. so we are saying white move black move white move black move and we are trying to see what will happen if we go in this path and then there are some branches and sub branches that are possible mm-hmm. in uh, mm-hmm. some cases so we are trying to see into the future this is what we are trying to achieve the objective of uh, calculation now this is possible only when we don't move pieces on the board because if you move make a move on the board it's present already it's not in the future mm. so you have to make the moves in your head yeah visualize, and visualize it in mm-hmm. your head what if we take this path how it is going to evolve in the future so one of the first things that we need to do while keep in mind while solving puzzle is not to move pieces and the second is uh, just getting the first move of the puzzle is not enough you have to find the complete answer mm-hmm. so many players mm-hmm. uh, if they get the first move right they think they have solved the puzzle and they see the uh, remaining moves quickly on the screen or from the book or from the mm-hmm. website but that's so, guesswork really yes. right yeah yeah 
So you have to get the complete solution without moving pieces in your head. Yeah. And in many puzzles, yeah. uh, one of the other common mistake many amateurs make is while solving, they tend to find good moves for themselves and very bad move for the opponent. Uh -huh. So <laughs> that way they yeah. they don't expect the opponent to resist. They simply expect the opponent mm. to they need fall to find into the best defense. Yeah, they well. have to find the best defense for the opponent and the mm. solution should be complete. Mm -hmm. So these are the criteria one need to keep in mind while solving puzzle. And uh, one of the dangers of solving puzzles online like leeches or chess.com is that it will say white to play and win. Yes. We guess the first we never white have, move. In a game, then, we never have that flag, white to play and win. Right? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, but that is there in the books as well. Uh -huh. They give you the indication. Yeah. But uh, I was coming to a slightly different point, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, we find the we make a guess on the first white move and then we move it on the screen mm -hmm. and then the computer if it is right it says good or whatever and then it makes a second black move mm. right so here we are not making an attempt to guess the opponent's reply for our move mm -hmm. and we are not seeing ahead in the future we are just guessing one move at a time this will not improve our calculation skills and that's why many players have high uh, puzzle solving rating but their uh, calculation skills are not right as right. good okay so you should never move pieces okay. get the full answer in your head maybe it's better to write down the answer so you are committed to the answer and then start making the moves and if the moves are not matching with what you have written then you already know you did not solve it right sure so just getting the first move by guess is not enough so this is just one way of improving calculation solving puzzles uh, the second is you have to take games of players who are good in calculation. So most of the strong players are very good in calculation. So you have to study those players games mm -hmm. because throughout the game they are not calculating. Only at important moments they mm -hmm. are calculating mm -hmm. and uh, to sense when we have to calculate, when we should use positional uh, principles and uh, play the moves. So to learn this it's better to see a full game and wherever calculation is required we do that. So. Analyzing games of uh, players who are good in calculation is another important way mm -hmm. to improve calculation. You have a book on calculation as well. Right? I've written a book on uh, calculation yes. as well, we'll, well. but it's uh, it's called improving mm -hmm. your calculation. Calculation, but it's uh, quite hard. It's probably for. Okay. Uh, uh, I have tried to analyze a position in depth for many yeah. pages, multiple pages. But I would say those who are reading the book to. <coughs> divide the material into multiple small pieces and take them in fragments and uh, solve them independently. Mm -hmm. And those who are quite good in calculation, you can try to do the whole thing in your head. So analyzing, uh, solving puzzles, analyzing complicated games of players who are good in calculation is a very good way. Third is to solve studies or compositions. They are very useful in improving our calculation. But the main difference between composition and uh, puzzles, puzzles are from practical games. Sure. Compositions mm -hmm. or studies are artificially composed positions. So they will not have even an extra pawn which is mm -hmm. not required. So all the units will have a role in the yeah. position, in the ultimate Yeah, solution. I always felt like that was a bit of a hack to reverse engineer it by thinking, yes. why is the pawn there? Because you wouldn't think yes. that in the game, right? Yeah. So. <clears throat> and here uh, in solving studies, we will see like there is only one solution, not multiple. In some puzzles, you can win in few different mm. ways. Yeah. Uh, but in studies, there will be only one path and uh, only in one correct sequence, it will work. But you think that's still useful? Very useful. Uh -huh. So if someone wants to improve their calculation, apart from solving puzzles, I would also recommend to solve maybe two or three studies every day. Because uh, solving puzzles, you can uh, solve puzzles anywhere from one minute to ten minutes if they are very mm -hmm. difficult but uh, to solve studies uh, it could take anywhere from 5 minutes to 45 minutes mm -hmm. uh, so it will take much more time and uh, effort uh, to solve compositions but they are fantastic way to improve calculation skills so one to three studies per day will be ideal to solve and the fourth way is to just take a good book on calculation and go through the positions the mm -hmm. explanations so for any topic, I would recommend these four ways. One, reading from books on that topic. Two, studying and analyzing games of players who are good in that particular area. Uh -huh. So let's say prophylaxis. You can study Karpos games, Petrosian's games. The... And you can uh, take a book on prophylaxis. Yeah. And then you can just see good positional games where 
these themes are coming repeatedly mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so you have to do all the kind of training in any area now it coming to conversion of advantage let's say so if i want to learn how to play from a better position then uh, one good thing one thing i can do is just uh, let's say most of the strong players are good at this mm-hmm. otherwise they would not have become stronger of course, yeah. so let's say kramnik now what i can do i can search for kramnik's win games mm-hmm. now i can put kramnik in chess base you can put kramnik in white mm-hmm. ignore colors and then 10 mm-hmm. you get all the white wins and put kramnik name in black and put 01 you get all the black wins mm-hmm. now put all these games in one folder so now you have all the games where Kramnik won. Mm-hmm. And then you can just uh, turn the engine on, go to a position where, let's say, Kramnik is white and it shows plus by minus, mm-hmm. where he has a clear advantage. And then turn off the engine, close the notation so you don't see the moves. Mm. Now you have a position where white is clearly better and white is Kramnik. Mm-hmm. So you put yourself in Kramnik's situation where you have a clear advantage and now you try to find Kramnik's moves. Mm. So similarly, you can do this for Carpo, Fisher, and so on where once they get a clear advantage from that point on how they play mm. so in terms of uh, converting winning advantages that's something i'm going to look at personally because uh, not converting winning advantages is something that has a big psychological effect on me and probably many players right when you get into a good position and you actually end up losing yeah um but chess psychology is such a huge field which i feel is severely underestimated. Um, Could you maybe just share a little of your general thoughts on psychology and how you can help a player's psychology improve? Yeah, I think as I mentioned, uh, chess psychology is something vastly neglected in, and it is seen as a separate field apart from chess training. So most of the chess coaches, they are focusing only on the technicalities of the game, like teaching them calculation, attack, Mm -hmm. and so on, openings and so on. Uh, For me, a good trainer's role is to not only teach the technicalities, but more importantly, make them effective learners and who can learn chess by themselves. So instead of uh, giving a hungry person fish, teach them to fish, Mm -hmm. right? So they can uh, catch a fish whenever they are hungry. So that's the approach uh, a good trainer should take. That's my view. So we have to teach them how to learn chess by themselves and in a more efficient manner. Uh, So this is uh, very important. And there are many psychological barriers that come in the way of effective learning. One is if we are constantly um, uh, trying to learn chess with a particular result in mind, aim in mind. For example, in the next tournament, which is coming after one month, I want to do well. Mm -hmm. So these are the reasons why many players are practicing. So here what is happening, we will not do things which will help us in the long run. We will just do things which we believe will help me in the next tournament, right? To do better in the next tournament. I will restrict myself to do, doing only those things. Mm. And then the next next tournament will come after one month. So I'll be doing things for that tournament. And when so I, well, yes, I, I often have a danger of ending in that territory. And what I end up doing is 90% is openings. Yes. Yeah, so because uh, you can immediately see in the tournament whether uh, what you have prepared is actually exactly, helping you or yeah. not. So I prepared this opening and in this yeah, game it cool. came, so I feel my work has been productive. Mm-hmm. Because I did something and it really happened in the game. But that's not how it should work. Because uh, to be a good chess player in the long run, you need to have multiple skills. So one of the primary objective uh, for a player is like we all want good results, no doubt. And it's very important. But again, the good result is just the consequence of what is what has happened prior to that. It's like uh, the salary that is uh, employee receives. So it's like you work for one month and then you get the salary, right? But we should not be working for the salary. If we're just working for the salary, we will not be doing a productive job, right? So I should enjoy this work. I have. I should feel I have to contribute. I have to grow. And in the process, I get rewarded for my effort. So the good results should be reward for the good effort we have put. So the first thing is uh, teaching the players that to learn chess effectively, to play chess effectively, from the player side, they have to put a good effort. Now, I'm not saying in a casual effort, it's good effort. So good effort means uh, you are fully involved in that activity. You are very interested in that activity. You are immersed in that 
activity and uh, you forget everything else mm-hmm. or that's happening around you mm-hmm. so you are so fully involved interested and immersed and with that kind of effort you mm-hmm. have to train so playing blitz training. with the tv on in the background doesn't count no playing blitz i would say is just for fun yeah so when you are playing blitz you can watch tv you can listen to music uh-huh. chat with your friends yeah. is okay if you are not taking it as part of your training if it is purely meant for fun mm-hmm. and i would say some part of our chess training should be fun as well it should not be too mm-hmm. serious because we cannot mm-hmm. sustain that seriousness for long and we'll get bored easily mm-hmm. so some part of mm-hmm. our training has to be fun so playing blitz is i would seriously welcome students to do that mm-hmm. but, but it, it should not be subs- the... it's not a substitute for training right. serious training okay but when you are trying to solve a puzzle or solve a study or mm-hmm. analyze an interesting position or studying some good players games so these are serious training at this point you have to be kind of you have to isolate yourself from the normal life and then focus fully on that activity the training part and the other barrier is our own self doubts um like would i become a chess good chess player or not because there's no guarantee that mm-hmm. if we do these things we will become mm-hmm. a, end up becoming a good player so there is no guarantee that our efforts will lead to progress improvement in our chess strength yeah. and that's my biggest manner, fear i'm going to spend the year playing chess yes. and my my rating will go down and also like uh, we may believe like we will improve but will we improve to the extent we want so let's say i am 2400 i want to become 2600 maybe i'll end up as 25 2450 then that's not enough for me right so this kind of self doubts uh, distractions like for uh, mm-hmm. young boys it's usually the video games uh But social is it, media is it correct to set that goal so so say i'm 2400 now should i be setting myself the goal i want to be 2600 in 2 years you can uh, set up such goals yes. uh in terms of rating or titles yes. like you want to become an im or a gm and so on these titles and ratings can be uh, part of your goal but uh, the goal the primary reason for setting a goal is to get ourselves a clear better picture of what needs to be done mm-hmm. to achieve this goal i have to do these things mm-hmm. and can i do these things mm-hmm. how am i going to find time to do these things am i interested enough to do these things because if i let's say if i want to become a 2600 player i'm 2200 now mm-hmm. i want to become a 2600 now i have to learn to defend in bad positions mm-hmm. i otherwise i cannot become a 2600 if i'm just going to lose in bad positions without putting up resistance mm. so i have to learn to play in bad positions which i may not like Mm-hmm. so one of the important things in training we have to learn is to be willing to learn things which we don't like mm. and uh, which we think is not important for me now but it may may be useful to me in the long run so you have to take a long term perspective so the aim will provide you a direction on what are the things you have to learn and how much effort you have to put to learn these things mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you have to spend lot of time uh, in learning these things and how many competitions you have to play to achieve these objectives that means uh, how are you going to manage your time between let's say your work and uh, chess or school and sure, chess sure. so this time management we have to consider seriously yeah. and how am i going to keep myself mm-hmm. physically in good shape emotionally in good shape mm-hmm. what is the mental attitude i need to have to ch- to uh, what are the mental changes i have to make in myself my attitude my philosophy so that i my learning and the performance becomes more efficient all these factors need to be considered mm-hmm. so to get a very good picture on all these aspects it's better to have a aim but the higher the aim more changes more sacrifices mm-hmm. we should be but i suppose there should be quite long term right there's no no it can use. be even 6 months six one months. year okay. it's fine yeah but the thing is like yeah. it should be achievable you yeah. cannot expect a huge jump in 6 months mm-hmm. so even if it is a small jump but it should entail some changes positive changes in mm-hmm. yourself and uh, some amount of hard work from your side it's good mm-hmm. and the uh, targets need not always have to be in terms of rating or titles you can just say in 3 months i want to improve my attacking skills mm-hmm. or my defensive skills or my end game skills 
or in six months I want to be good attacking player. Mm -hmm. So you can have such targets as well on which areas you want to get better. Yeah. On that note, um, you are a strong proponent of not placing too much focus on ratings. Uh, you feel like it's unhealthy for the player. Could you explain a bit why? Yeah, because uh, for example, let's say if I, when we were very young children, mm -hmm. we play hide and seek mm -hmm. or running and catching, right? Mm -hmm. There was no aim. Mm -hmm. We played it for fun, right? And uh, let's say if you are running and catching and we get caught, mm -hmm. we lose mm -hmm. in that game. But mm -hmm. we don't want to go home after that loss. We want to continue playing the next game, next game, the next game. So we enjoy by nature. We enjoy the process of participating, learning, competing. But what happens when things don't go our way, the results don't go the way we want, we tend to get upset. And then uh, when we focus too much on the rewards, mm. like the rating is a reward, right? If you play well, you get more rating. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the rating and also the result, if you win, you get one point. If you lose, you get zero point. So when we focus too much on the reward aspect, mm -hmm. then we stop enjoying the process of learning, participating, competing. Uh, so and you, only if you are fully able to participate wholeheartedly in this process of competing, you can actually grow stronger. So uh, if we focus on the rating and the race results too much, even while preparing, we will be thinking in terms of result. If, maybe if I play this, it will only end in a draw or uh, how can I win in this position? So we avoid certain openings, certain type of mm -hmm. positions. Mm -hmm. And similarly, when we are playing a game, when we get a bad position, we start thinking maybe I'm going to lose today. Unhelpful, and when you, right? Yeah, and then uh, we panic. Mm. And we make mistakes and eventually end up losing. Mm. So our concentration will immediately be disturbed whenever we think more on the rewards. So it's better to... Uh, have a name and then focus more on the process. Mm -hmm. So if you are playing mm -hmm. in a tournament game, it's better mm -hmm. to focus on mm -hmm. playing mm -hmm. a good sure. game. And for this, mm -hmm. so I would say instead of rating and result, we can have two healthier alternatives, which will not put pressure on us. That is good effort from our side while playing a game. So I have to put good effort. So when I go to a tournament game, instead of thinking I have to win today, I should not lose today, a draw is good. Instead of thinking along these terms, if I can tell myself my aim today in this game is I want to keep good concentration and put a very good effort mm -hmm. at finding good moves and playing them. Mm -hmm. So here my expectancy is only on myself. I need to keep good concentration, put a good effort. Mm -hmm. Right. So and if you can also add one more thing, which is to learn, uh, because if you want to be a good player, you have to be a good learner. You have to be a good student who is very good at learning mm. things from experience, whatever is mm. happening to us, good or bad. We have to learn something useful, which will make us better. So I'm going to put good effort in today's game and, uh, and I'm going to learn many good things about chess. So if you can go to a game with this kind of mindset, even in games we will lose, we can learn something good, mm. right? And then you will feel you are not having as much pressure and you will have better chances of playing a better quality game. Mm, I couldn't agree more. I'm, I'm thinking of myself as an example. So uh, what we're saying is, so I'm trying to get Grandmaster. I go and play a tournament and maybe in the last round I can make a Grandmaster norm. And let's say I lose the game, but I play a good game. I have good concentration and effort. What I should do is I should try and go away from the game feeling like that was that was good. Like yes. I shouldn't be too disappointed. You should not be too disappointed with that. Yeah. Because... Uh, if you ask any grandmaster, did they make three norms in three different tournaments and that's it? No. Multiple times they would have failed. They would have come very close to making the norm and then it slips away. So it happens multiple times and eventually they get the three norms. So it is a process and it's not always going to be the way we want it to be. And things are not going to happen when we want them to happen in the way we want it to happen. So many unpleasant things, untimely things are going to happen and the most important thing is we don't give up hope on ourselves and the best thing is if you can learn something good even from such unpleasant experiences that makes us stronger in the long run so 
I see chess also as a tool to uh, cultivate, nurture, build good, strong, healthy qualities in a human. Great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Prague, your, your star student. He's uh, lighting the chess world on fire. And on top of that, he just seems like a, such a lovely guy as well. Whenever I see clips of him, he's so humble, he's so kind. Um, I guess what people don't see behind the scenes is some of the uh, tough periods and, and the blood and tears, if you will, of the journey that you've had with him. Um, so maybe you could share a little about some of the toughest moments or periods you've had through your many years of mentorship with him. Yeah, so I started working with Brag when he was like seven and a half or eight years old. And he was already a very strong player in the sense he was a world under eight champion. So uh, that's when I started working with him and uh, his sister Vaishali. So she was also, I believe, under 10 world champion, something like that. Mm -hmm. And both were extremely hardworking from a very young age. They were practicing almost six to eight hours a day, sometimes even uh, 10 hours because they were not uh, going to school on a daily basis. Because uh, from a very young age, they were clear that uh, they are reasonably good at chess because they were already world champions in mm. uh, their respective mm -hmm. categories. And uh, they believe uh, with the sustained focus and effort, they could uh, become eventual world champions. So they were very clear about their target from a very young age and extremely hardworking. And uh, they have made a lot of sacrifices. I have seen uh, personally, like uh, where they live from uh, our club, our academy, it's close to one to one and a half hours uh, of travel mm -hmm. one way. They go every day? Yeah, they used to come every day almost wow. uh, when they were not so, playing in So two hour round trip over yes. two hours. Yes, and uh, they will come in the morning and... Uh, they will come in a two-wheeler with a parent. Okay. And sometimes yeah. it's raining What's heavily. What's a two-wheeler, sorry? Like so a... it's a motorbike. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so it helps. It just, uh, but but motor... there's three of them, no? The, the, the parent drives them? Yes. How do you fit? Uh, uh, all three uh, on one motorbike? Three and one motorbike. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. they, don't, they, they, they don't do that now, I guess. Not anymore. <laughs> when they were very young. Yeah. So okay. when they were very young kids, uh, uh, there was no good public transportation mm. from their place to our location. So sometimes it's too hot, sometimes it's raining and uh, they come in the morning for the sessions and then uh, have lunch in our place and have dinner by 9 o'clock or so and then they leave and reach home by 10.30. So, it's a lot of hard work from the parents' side as well, a lot of sacrifices. And the children never complain. And uh, the other good thing I've noticed is like when they uh, finish a tournament, let's say they became national champion, national under 10 champion or whatever, the very next day they will come for the class. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've seen uh, yeah. in recent times, many children, mm -hmm. they want to celebrate, mm. uh, to relax yeah. or take some rest from chess. But for the Prag and uh, Vaishali, Chess itself is rest and relaxation for them. Uh -huh. So they so, love chess yeah. so much. And uh, on, on that been... note, is it okay to take a rest day? Because for me personally, after I play a big tournament and I, I fly back, the next day I'm probably dead. Um, yeah, so for most of the things, there are no hard and fast rules. Mm -hmm. uh, how I see is like all these questions are very important, mm -hmm. but the answers are not very important. In the sense, uh, I can give an example. Like one of my students, he was asking me, is it okay if I watch television during tournaments? Mm -hmm. And he was feeling guilty if he watched tournament, if he watched television during tournaments, mm -hmm. because I am not probably being serious or devoted mm -hmm. uh, like few other children who are not watching television during tournaments. And I said, like, why not uh, do an experiment? So in the next tournament, try not to watch any television and see mm -hmm. how it goes. So mm -hmm. he did not watch any tournaments. He played very well. And then he came back and said, like, now I understand I should not watch television during tournament because mm -hmm. I play very well. Then I said, let's see the other side of the coin as well. So the next tournament, you try to watch maybe half an hour to one hour of television <laughs> every day and see how it goes. And he played well. Mm -hmm. uh, after watching half so an hour or one it's hour. Probably fine. So mm -hmm. then now he came back and asked the same right. question. Should I watch television or not? So the question is important, but the answer is not. In the sense, you have to find your own path. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
so because these critical questions mm -hmm. show that you are mm -hmm. trying to understand yourself better mm -hmm. you are trying to mold your habits in a certain manner whether you should watch tv or not watch tv you are trying to find a solution to this question mm -hmm. which is bothering you but mm -hmm. usually these are not the deciding factors that is going to decide whether you will play perform well or not in a tournament there are the other factor many other factors these are not the deciding factors this is just a irrelevant minor issue mm -hmm. but these minor issues they are bothering us so this is what happens with most players they are too much worried about irrelevant minor issues mm -hmm. when they should be focusing on the really relevant issues mm -hmm. so which is i need to have good concentration i need to have good confidence in myself small disappointments like i lost yesterday should not make me lose confidence in myself i need to be able to carry on positively in the remaining games so these are more relevant how do i do this if i lose a game how can i see that um, i get disappointed i get sad if i lose a game which is fine and natural but i don't start doubting myself whether you don't become a weak player in one day because of one loss mm -hmm. and you don't become a great player in one day because you win one game so as they say form is temporary but class is permanent mm -hmm. uh we had to cut the video yesterday because you're a very busy man ramesh um <laughs> we're here with the american gambits at the global chess league and you are the captain for the american gambits uh currently the team has won two matches lost three matches uh, it's a very tough field. All of the top players are playing. Uh, we've got Nakamura, Duda, and Yang Yi. I'm here as the translator and second of Yang Yi. And then uh, with the women's boards, we've got Bib Bibisara, women's uh, Blitz World Champion, and Pet Pates, Elizabeth Pates, who has a lot of experience. And then our prodigy is uh, Jonas, Jonas Biere. Uh, so in theory, we have a strong team, and it's going okay. We're in contention for top two. Um, how how do you feel uh, the team spirits are, and I guess how how do you feel your role can really help the team as the captain? Okay, so regarding the composition of the team, it's a balanced team, um, and we have to make with what we have. So there's no point in uh, getting into the merits and demerits of uh, the value of the team, the player strength, and so on. And having said that, it's. Uh, I initially felt before the tournament that uh, the tournament could be very tough for us because uh, some other teams looked on paper to be better than us, uh, better composed. Uh, um, but uh, having uh, seen the first five games, uh, it feels uh, like we are actually in a better position uh, mm -hmm. in compared with uh, some of our competitors who are fighting for the second place because. Uh, uh, Pet so who had some struggle initially has recovered well in the last two games she has won both the games and against a decent uh, opposition so she will be in a good frame of mind hopefully and uh, Duda has been uh, getting good position in almost every game he plays and uh, in the game he lost uh, he made a blunder and uh, collapsed the position against Wei and even in that game he was uh, having a much better position so uh, his game quality has in general been uh, very good and he played a very good game against Arjun, uh, it, which ended in a draw yesterday. And also Hikaru, he has been raising his game level. Uh, game to game, he is playing much better. So uh, Duda, uh, Hikaru and Elizabeth, they have been uh, uh, getting better with each game. Um, with um, with Bire, he has been playing very high quality chess as well. And uh, yesterday, it was very unfortunate. Uh, from a better position it became equal and then he became worse and uh, lost the game uh, that can happen to anyone under pressure but if we leave out the final round result of Bere, he has been playing quite well as well so most of our players and the ua has been uh, extremely solid on board three so there is no particular player that we need to worry about and bibisara she lost three games that's a cause for concern but not because of her uh, game quality which has been pretty decent uh, except the uh, last round loss uh, where she was kind of unrecognizable but the other two losses she was in fact winning or clearly better and then she still managed to lose those two games so if uh, bibisara also comes back into form i think we are in a good position because other teams uh, there are some clear weaknesses on certain boards 
and we can uh, if you are in good form we can exploit that to our advantage yeah this this tournament's quite unique uh, because of the team team format but also the time control yes. is 20 minutes with no increment and that gives a lot of time pressure uh, people aren't used to playing without increment and there's been some controversies maybe you can share a bit about the um the game the sort of draw off a rule and sort of your opinion on it yeah so the current rule says like if you have a winning position and more importantly uh, sometimes the win can be very difficult to find the computer may give plus seven because it has seen a very clear win which is very impossible for a human to see we are not talking about such winning position but more to the point is when open has no proper uh, winning methods in a normal game you should not be able to win in such situations uh, if i have less than two minutes on my clock i have the option to pass the clock and uh, call the arbiter and claim a draw because i don't have enough time on my clock to execute all my moves so in that case if the opponent arbiter feels the opponent doesn't have uh, any cha good chances to play for a win the position is lost he can avoid the draw which is what happened in the game between uh, nihal versus dada and there was an appeal against this decision but the rule is quite clear on this has the appeal failed already yes oh it's yes, failed yes addition has been taken okay it's very yeah. interesting because uh, magnus was very very upset about it because it meant his team lost a crucial match right yes um I get, so the wording in, in the rule it's a very old rule actually because yes, previously because we don't, everybody it's a world time control increment. as well <laughs> exactly but everybody forgot about it because now we all play with increment yeah. so the wording is um uh, if your opponent is not try able to win by normal means you can claim a draw but there is a little bit of a gray area there right because in in yes. the game between Saren and Dada uh sure uh Saren was up a bishop in an end game bishop and rook versus rook and there was there was a couple pawns um but is there is there an argument that Dada could win by normal means or is it is it that yeah there is yeah. Uh, I, in this case i would say no uh, that uh, he in a normal case he can play for a win uh, that can happen only when often is in time trouble or he p makes an unexpected blunder yeah i suppose the position is so simplified right yes that you're not going to win yeah, that yeah um, there is also this um, uh, ambiguity uh, where it is left to the interpretation of the arbiter there is some gray area yes sure, there are some gray areas and yeah. this also was yeah. raised in the meeting yeah. with the arbiters today and they'll be taking it to the FIDE Arbiter Commission and try to address these issues. Yeah. But there will always be some gray areas in most of the rules, I would say. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, um, another topic. Um, the other day, uh, you brought uh, myself and a number of the players to the gym. Um, <laughs> how is your back doing, by the way? Not really good. Uh, Still I not say. good. Uh, it's getting better. Um, but I try to do some... Uh, stuff which Bibi Sara was teaching you guys and uh, for my age and my back condition it did not uh, so <laughs> work out well. <laughs> Bibi Sara is a rhythmic gymnast yeah. and she was doing like cartwheels, yes. somersaults <laughs> and then I had I was like oh we should try this and I went to try failed miserably and I egged Ramesh on to try and, <laughs> and Ramesh tried. Ramesh, you actually did probably the best out of all of us but, but the next day, <laughs> in the elevator, he told me, I can't move my back. <laughs> yeah, the whole night I couldn't sleep. Uh, back then, it did not have any immediate impact. Mm. But, it's getting uh, better though, right? It's getting yeah. better. Okay. Hopefully in a day or two. As long as I haven't crippled the world's <laughs> top trainer. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, but on that topic, um, how important do you feel is physical conditioning for chess plus? I remember distinctly when I was uh, very young, the top players in India, not just in India, but uh, even uh, otherwise, rest of the world, I could see they had big pot bellies. They oh, were wow. terribly out of shape. And it was considered very normal. Um, and uh, typically, they used to have one round per day. And uh, mm -hmm. you did not have computers, so you don't mm -hmm. prepare much for the games uh -huh. back uh -huh. then. So we don't... Uh, we probably will prepare uh, half an hour for mm -hmm. the game, that's mm -hmm. it, because we may have one or two books with us. We can't carry much information, they're so heavy. So it's practically impossible to prepare for your opponent. And so what players usually do, they drink the whole night, play some card games, get up late and play the directly come to the game. So it was very unhealthy lifestyle, I would say. And uh, the players were not very fit. 
but they got away most with of the it. Players, and they could get away with it mm. because the others were in a similar situation right. and also the game was not as complex mm. as it is now uh -huh. in the sense uh, earlier if you play a nine round tournament at least for the first three rounds you won't have any tough time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know that you're going to win mm -hmm. now sorry nowadays. and probably we will uh, win in very short time mm -hmm. the opponent will just blunder in the first 10 15 moves and in a few more moves we will win the game in half an hour most of the boards will be empty for the first three games mm. because the lower rated players they will not play good quality chess but now even uh, 1600 or 1700 of uh, today uh, will not make uh, silly blunders that's they because you're coaching all of them <laughs> 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 no, access to information mm. everyone has computers okay. books easy yeah. easy to learn now much in comparison to the past but nowadays the level of opposition mm. The general playing strength has improved uh, considerably and as a result, uh, we are not finding basic mistakes. And in every game, in, if you are playing a nine round tournament, you have to fight most likely in all the nine games. And uh, it can be, and uh, nowadays you all, everyone has computers with them. So they have the information. So everyone is preparing a lot before the game, which was not the case earlier. So you play a four to six hour game. And then uh, before that, you are preparing maybe three to four hours. So it's basically like close to 10 hours of chess every day. And after five, six days, this can already mean too much, become too much because not just the physical strain part, but also emotionally, you are going through a roller coaster. And uh, if you have had some tough moments, it can really <coughs> drain you, mm -hmm. drain your energy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last few rounds, the player will not be able to perform at their peak. So it's very important. Uh, we give more attention not just to the technical aspects of the game, how well we play chess, but also to the emotional aspects and also to the energy levels of the player. They should be well rested, have a good night's sleep every day. And uh, you should be in a peak condition uh, fitness to, especially in the last three games, I would say. Uh, rather than the battery draining, your battery should right. be full right. uh, in the last uh, three rounds. Mm -hmm. And that means mm -hmm. you also require uh, to be in good physical shape, exercise and healthy diet. Mm -hmm. So one thing I used to do when I was a player, I used to work out in the morning and then play the game in the afternoon. But then I was not performing well because I'm already getting tired mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of uh, the physical exertion. And then the preparation, three hour preparation and then the game. Mm. So I'm already quite tired by then. So it's uh, the physical activity can be done after the game. Mm -hmm. That way you also let out the stress that has built mm. in your mm. system during the game. Mm. So when you work out, it can just be a long walk or any sport or uh, you can hit the gym. Any of this activity, I would recommend. Yeah. We need to follow your example. The the guys at home don't know this, but yesterday we had a pull up competition, <laughs> and Ramesh was banging out pull ups. I think you did like ten, like yeah, I don't know, eight to ten probably. Yeah, I was yes. I was super impressed, like amazing. Um, but yeah, I hope your back gets better <laughs> soon. Um, okay. Um, uh, I'd like to be selfish for a moment and ask for some personal advice. <clears throat> so. I'm trying to get Grandmaster. I'm going to follow all of your advice on uh, working hard in terms of the training, the sort of different um, methods of training, uh, cultivating the passion, trying to improve my psychology, not to focus on the rating and the result, but rather on the effort. Um, is, there, is there anything... Uh, anything else that um, you think I can I can really incorporate into my training and approach for this sort of next one year that I've given myself? So I would say like uh, you rightfully summarized uh, the key elements. One is, uh, as I mentioned, the three things, uh, the physical part, the mental part and the chest part. So the physical part, lead a healthy lifestyle, eat healthy food, good sleep. So food, sleep and exercise, this is the physical part. So mm -hmm. we need to take care of these three. And uh, the mental part, there are two ways to put it. For example, if I have a table in front of me, now if I don't add any dirt to the table, the table will still get dirty by itself because of nature. Some dust will settle 
after five years we if we open this room it will be full of cobwebs mm -hmm. dirt settled over a period of time it will eventually anyway get dirty so the process of accumulating dirtiness is ongoing process and uh, the second thing is i contribute to this i leave some papers tissues and then it gets dirty faster right so in hotels we can see people come and clean the table every day that's why it remains clean not because mm -hmm. no one puts dirt on it someone is cleaning this and keeping it clean so the same way our mind um, one even if we don't add negativity to the mind the negativity is accumulating as a natural process because we live in a world where we move with other people and there is the environmental factor so there will always be some negativity and we driving a car there is a red signal right immediately we become negative without us realizing oh i have to wait for some time right so this negativity is gradually accumulating every day and the second is uh, we add more negativity to the system for example if i lose my game i keep thinking oh how can i play such a bad game uh, how can i miss this simple calculation oh i'm so bad at this i'm stupid right like, i'm stupid yeah. so when we do this more and more we are just adding more tissues papers mm -hmm, to the mm -hmm. table it gets dirty faster so the point is who is going to do the cleaning <laughs> right in a hotel someone will come and clean the table for you but who is going to do the cleaning in your mm -hmm. mind mm -hmm. so all the activity negativity that is gender gradually accumulating and the faster ones in lumps which we are adding this needs to be cleaned as well otherwise what happens it's like it acts it kind of blocks uh, the clocks the system mm -hmm. and you will not be able to perform efficiently so we were always like hyper or tense nervous mm -hmm. and so on negative so generally that's why if uh, people believe in meditation they should consider learning mm -hmm. it properly and doing it regularly mm -hmm. you will not find the impact immediately but over a period of time you will see it does have a huge impact uh, where we are able to deal with the negative emotions in a much better way now how does this help in the game like for example if i have a slightly worse position or sometimes the position is perfectly fine but i don't like the position and i may think i'm worse mm -hmm. so when i get this feeling then i may start panicking mm -hmm. oh my god i'm going to lose today probably mm -hmm. and my opponent is a better player than me right and i have a bad position and yesterday i lost mm. already my rating is dropping down so you keep adding more thoughts to mm. a perfectly normal position and then uh, when lot more negativity is added mm. we start panicking and then the concentration is lost we make mistakes and we will eventually lose yeah, the I game yeah i find it worse for me when i feel like my last move was a bad move yeah. right it's tough to it's a difficult moment like uh, i have seen in an interview where vishyan and said one of the difficult moments for a chess player during the game is when you realize you have just made a mistake and to recover from that is not uh, very easy but you need to so, clean it out clean yeah out so basically thing. we have to understand it's not uh, we are not alone in this it's not like only i am having all these emotions but everyone does but we also see that there are many players who despite all these uh, handicaps just like us they are able to perform at a higher level right they are able to keep these things aside and still perform well so it is possible to live with all these kind of emotions and still play your best chess and this is what we have to aspire for we should not try for to manipulate the environment to be perfect so we don't get this negative thoughts no things will be fluid and uh, there will be many temptations for us to become negative we should resist the temptation and not become negative mm -hmm. so that's why i say focus on the effort so now okay so if you feel your position is worse and your opponent is good now you cannot change your opponent nor can you change the position so simply accept the reality as it is and don't judge it just accept like okay i have a slightly worse position against a better mm -hmm. opponent that means now i have two alternatives i can just give up hope and play whatever i feel like and pay the price or i can collect myself and then uh, calm down and then stop making any more mistakes okay i've already made some mistakes so my position is worse and let me see what happens if i stop making any more mistakes and that's when you start resisting and then good chance when you stop making mistakes you won't lose the game even if your position is slightly worse so 
keeping the mind under control is uh, very essential it, but it's not easy it's tough but first we have to realize this is required and then find ways to make it happen <clears throat> the third is the chess part you have to work on all the aspects i mentioned uh, the other day like your calculation skills attacking skills positional chess end games openings and so on of this what i would recommend if you consider yourself as an active player attacking player then i would say focus more on your calculation maybe first two three months uh, give calculation your priority so what i would generally recommend for every few weeks you have to keep changing your priorities mm -hmm. so you touch mm -hmm. all the important areas mm -hmm. so this week i'm going to focus on this area next week i'm going to focus on something else and so on mm -hmm. so initially for one or two months give more priority to your calculation skills mm -hmm. And for this, you have to do one, as I said, solve puzzles without moving pieces, get the complete answer mm -hmm. and get it right. So if you are not getting it right, maybe your concentration is not good or you are deciding too early. Like once you see some interesting idea, you are convincing yourself the answer is right. If that is happening, avoid to do that. Check, Learn to check your own answer for mistakes. And the third... Um, Sorry, on puzzles, do you uh, set a time limit for the puzzle? No, not really. Uh, the most important thing is to get the answer right. But it's, So you can take more time. But it's not practical to, for example, spend two hours on one puzzle, right? Because in no, the game that is too much. That's right. a bit too much. Yeah. Uh, so I, w I don't want to say you have to take 30 seconds or two minutes or four minutes. Yeah. I don't want to put a number because it depends on one, on the difficulty level of the position. But the difficulty of the position sure. is dependent on the strength sure. of the player. Sure. Or the absence of but, uh, strength I mean, of the player. An upper limit. Because for, for myself, I am sometimes a perfectionist. So if I don't find the solution, I can spend a very long time. No, you should not. So right. you have to give yourself, uh, let us say, that's where your uh, individual skills will come into play. So you have to look at the position and say, okay, for this position, anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes is fine yeah. if i get this portion in a tournament game yeah i may have to think five minutes or ten minutes yeah so normally to find probably the truth. no more than 15 20 minutes yeah not more than that yeah. uh if you are doing that most likely you are uh, mismanaging your time yeah you are not being efficient you're just wasting your time so it's better not to take uh, more than 10 15 yeah. minutes to solve a position yeah puzzles uh, puzzles ideally five to ten minutes mm -hmm. not more but if you are uh, doing very difficult ones you, but you should do very difficult ones when you are calculation skills are at a good level. Mm -hmm. In that case, still mm -hmm. you should be able to get it in five to ten minutes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but when you are solving studies, initially you can take like 15-20 minutes also. But here it's better to do under a trainer initially because they can give you positions. Sorry about that. So they can give you positions appropriate to your level. Uh, mm -hmm. So in my case like i divide the positions into different levels on all topics mm -hmm. let's say attack or calculation or end games mm -hmm. anything on all the topics i divide it into five different levels so mm -hmm. when i start working with the player i will test them with uh, let's mm -hmm. say second level position mm -hmm. if they are struggling i'll go to first level yeah and so on so uh, you have to if you have someone like that it's helpful but for most we don't have that luxury so you have to take the common sense call and uh, solving puzzles five to ten minutes not more i would say in general except in uh, rare cases and solving uh, compositions or studies maybe anywhere from five to twenty minutes you can uh, take to solve and uh, analyzing complicated games you have to do that and uh, read good book on uh, calculation attack and so on and then you do this for a couple of months you should see improvement already uh, probably from the second week itself you should start feeling i'm getting better mm -hmm. that's basically the ideal benchmark if your work is productive if your work is productive you should feel i'm getting better it's mm -hmm. just like let's say someone who has not been going to gym regularly mm -hmm. let's say last one year you have not gone to gym but prior you were and uh, now you want to start doing exercise again so after one or two weeks, you should already mm. start feeling you are able to do exercise for longer time. You are able to lift slightly higher weights or you are able to run a few minutes longer. Mm. Basically, you, are, it should show, you should be aware yourself that I am getting growing stronger. Mm. If you don't get that feeling 
and if you're just hitting the gym every day that means we are not doing something right so just like if you work out regularly it will you will feel it yourself first yeah and then others will notice it too okay right similarly in if you are doing good quality preparation at home okay. you should feel that improvement in yourself i am getting better you should have that feeling if that is missing then we have to make changes to how we see chess definitely makes sense hopefully i'll be able to update you with some uh, good personal progress really yeah. appreciate your advice mm-hmm. uh you have many many fans out there many people who would love to uh work with you learn from you um <laughs> I know your chess school is becoming more and more digitized. Is there what's the sort of way if somebody wants to be part of your chess school how can they kind of reach you? Yeah, so I started my chess school in uh, 2008 um and it's called the Chess Gurukul and it's based in Chennai. So it was basically uh started as a physical academy where uh, children from Chennai my city they come after school hours. and they learn from our coaches and uh, i also work with uh, players from around the country who travel to chennai stay and then uh, learn for we have uh, many camps every month so these are the two avenues but these camps are usually for the students i'm already working with based on their rating strength and we also provide uh, online training i also teach in various platforms like uh, prochestraining.com there we teach uh, indian evening hours almost every day we have around uh, 40 to 50 trainers including many top grandmasters to like uh, kasim sanu wow, okay. ivan yeah. sokolov suresh ekar ganguly yeah. myself there are many top trainers uh, who are teaching in this platform and uh, classes are happening throughout the year so mm-hmm. that is one way to uh, not just learn from myself i also teach in that platform uh, a lot and also from uh, other good trainers from around the world and the second is uh, you can also come to visit our website chessgurukul.com and uh, if you write to our uh, admin that you want to get trained by me they will uh, put you in touch and we can uh, take it forward mm-hmm. from there so you you also do you do the group coaching you also take on one to one students still that depends uh, because of the time busy, factor yeah? because yeah. of the time factor yeah. so uh, for the us students i have uh, two different groups uh, one is below 2200 the other is about 2200 mm-hmm. so we have two different groups where i teach twice uh, a week uh, uh, in the evening time us so most of my us students they are accommodated in these groups and uh, i also have a group for uh, indian students uh i teach uh, early morning before they go to school mm-hmm. uh, that also happens twice a week and uh, i also work with uh, some six seven grandmasters and uh, for that i have a group in the day time we have like two hour online sessions <coughs> even though most of them are from chennai mm-hmm. and uh, so similarly like i have different groups based on the rating of the players yeah. and uh, four groups basically and i try to teach mm-hmm. them online Right. We'll share the link so everybody can access. <coughs> um, Thanks. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>